in God's Word. If you join me in a word of prayer to ask Him to lead us and guide us. Pray with me. Father, we rejoice in all that You do. And as we sang that song praising Your name, we ponder all it is that You do. And Lord, even though we may think of the entire world, the universe, all of Your creation, now I ask that You would help us draw our focus right back into this place. I ask that You would help us to consider what You have done in our individual lives to bring us to this moment, this day, that is like none that have come before and will be like none that come after. Because this is the day that You have made and this is the place You have called us to be and these are the words You have called us to ponder in our hearts. I ask that You would free us from distraction. I pray that You would remove the evil one from our presence. I pray that You would fill this place, this room with Your Holy Spirit and that You would dwell in our very hearts. That You would pour out Your grace, Your mercy, and Your perfect peace. Amen. So, the prayer of the Lord. When we talk about the Lord's Prayer, it's, it's a difficult subject because we all have so much history with it. If you grew up in the church, you likely were taught to memorize this prayer. And we pray it with great frequency. And one of the things that is very difficult, but something I really want us to, to struggle with a little bit, is how do we look at these words new? And today we've used the, re- the story of the resurrection and also a look at God's overarching story of Him calling us to be His image bearers in this world. And that Jesus, by Him raising from the dead, has created the new humanity, the new people who rule who, who rule this earth. I know you may, you may not sit there and go, well, I, I don't rule anything. I, I just go home and drink coffee. I don't know what you're talking about. It, yes, but see, I, that's why I want, I want us to view the Lord's Prayer in light of the fact that you and I have been called to build up God's people, to join Him in the advancing of His kingdom. This is the prayer of the Lord. He said, this then is how you should pray. I want you to take a look at John chapter 1, verse 12. Because the first phrase in the the Scripture is, Our Father who art in heaven, right? That's what we say. Um, Look at John 1, 12. He says, this is where the Apostle John is introducing... um, Jesus on the scene and he's telling this story about who Jesus is and what he does and he's about to in verse 18 to say he is the one that reveals the father and look at this he says yet to all who received him that is Jesus to those who believed in his name the name of Jesus he gave what are those words the right to become the children of God you see We have to say this a lot, but I want to say it again. If you grew up or you sort of went through life thinking that life is all about, well, if I can do a little more, try a little harder, get a little better, and then maybe God will like me, may I just declare to you that is false teaching. It is the opposite of the gospel, the good news. The good news of Jesus is that if we would simply believe in Him, believe His story, believe the truth of what He says to you and to me, that we are now His children. And He gave us the right to be His children. This is more than an inalienable right, if you follow my my expression there. This is more than a government or a civil right. This is an eternal right. It goes beyond the dirt that we're standing on. It goes beyond the very earth. It goes to God Almighty. A right given to us by the One who spoke and created the universe by His speaking. This is what we're talking about. When you and I pray, Our Father, We're not praying like our Father who art in heaven. We're not praying that way. We are praying, Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I need your help. I do. And not because I deserve it or because I'm a good guy. I've been been living pretty good this last few days. I mean, you should see. I'm at least 37% righteous. And we don't play those games. No, I am your child. See, this is what the Lord's Prayer calls us to do. Jesus is saying, this is how you should pray. You should call to God as your Father, because He is. He's your Father, He's my Father, not because of our behavior, but because of His behavior. And He then creates in us the belief that that behavior has made a difference in our lives. It changes everything about our prayers. Yesterday I was with uh, 
Roger and Dee. Roger had triple bypass surgery yesterday, and it was an eight-hour surgery, and it was one of those deals, and we were at the hospital, and we we're all praying, and I said, you know, one of the things that's really important for us to do right now is to pray as not just as, you know, people saying, well, God, I hope you're listening up there somewhere, you know. No, we're his kids. Of course he's listening. Those of you who are parents, if, if, if your kids come to you, now, now, I know this analogy doesn't hold all the water because sometimes your kids come to you and you're like, not right now, please. God's not like that, see. see but thankfully, praise God, he's not like that. Your kids come to you and, you're, and he, he, when we come to him, you know what he does? He listens because he loves us. Take a look at Luke 17, verses 20 to 21. Because we then pray, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Right? We pray that. And, and when we do that, we're, we're not saying, you know, well, I hope whatever you want is going to happen. We're talking about the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know if you guys knew this, but we're in a political season right now. I don't know if you guys were aware of that. So kingdoms are actually kind of on in the mind right now. And I don't know about you, but I have a fair amount of anxiety about our kingdom uh, right now. So... I love what Jesus says here in Luke 17 because even though there is the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God and and sometimes there's overlap, there's all kinds of things going on, um, look at what Jesus says to us. He's teaching us this. The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation or if you get the right Supreme Court justices. Nor will people say, here it is, because we have the right candidate, or there it is, because Jesus says the kingdom of God is where? Yeah. I want you to ponder that the next time your favorite news channel whips you into a frenzy and makes you think the world's coming to an end. It may be, but when it does, it'll be because Jesus cries out and opens the sky with his voice and the trumpet shout, and he descends on earth and he calls you and I to be with him, to meet him in the air, and all the dead in Christ will rise. This is the promise. This is, this is why we sit in the creed, you know. We believe in the resurrection of the body. This is going to happen. And it, it's going to happen. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead, and then he did this crazy thing. He, he, he poured out his Holy Spirit into us so that the kingdom of God is within you and within me. Wherever we go, whatever we do. You remember when we were looking at the image of God and that whole discussion about how, you know, I don't know if you guys noticed, but there, there was this tractor that rolled out. And the tractor broke down. It had the, you know, the cloud above. And the dude with his scepter, what did it change into? A wrench. And so it was his sacred duty to fix that tractor. You see how that works? You know, my Uncle Marty would always call this vocation. And vocation was a Latin word that means calling. And it made it into our language, which means that's what you do for a living. But it's interesting how those two are probably the same. And what we mean by that is, is that, you know, there, as I look out across the congregation, I see all kinds of vocations, every kind you can imagine. And I see skills and abilities and talents. And, and as I look out and see all of those, I'm pondering how the Lord has woven all of this together. And that when you are, you know, I'm looking over at Dennis. When Dennis is cooking, it's a sacred duty. You know, when I'm looking over here and I'm seeing, I'm seeing a pharmacist, it's a sacred duty. And when I'm seeing somebody who helps people get their home, it's a sacred duty. And when I'm seeing someone who helps take care of the people who are in trouble with fires and every other kind of thing, sacred duty. And when I'm seeing a retired person, sacred duty. Do you follow me? And everything in between. Those are just samples that I'm just grabbing at the, as I look around the room. And what I'm trying to teach you guys, and what no, I'm not trying to teach you, the Lord is teaching you, and I'm just I'm up here doing my duty of to say what he's saying, and that that is the kingdom of God within you. And that that was his plan from the foundation of the earth to call you, his children, and to say, let's get to work. That's exactly what this is. And when we pray, thy kingdom come, what we're actually asking him to do is would you please help me do what, you would, what it is you would have me do in such a way that it happens on earth as if it was in heaven. Because what we're really asking for is we want heaven to be here right now. Take a look at Ephesians 2, verse 6. Speaking of heaven and earth. Now what I'm doing is I'm just taking us on a little tour of all kinds of scriptures that support the Lord's Prayer that, that give us more depth into what's behind it. And look at Ephesians 2.6. Now, all of chapter 2 is good, but, you know, there is football today. We've got to be careful. Although, 
You know, the Chiefs game is until tonight, so we, we could go longer, but we won't. God raised us up. Do you notice that's past tense? Raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the what? The heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now, you're, you might be like me, and you might be sit there and go, what in the world does that mean? And when we get to heaven, I'm sure we'll get to find out in detail. But in the meantime, we can ponder it, we can apprehend it, we can grab a hold of it and say, what in the world is this? And he's saying that we are raised up with Christ right now. In heaven. <laughs> On earth, I should say, as it is in heaven. He, this has already happened to you and me. What a powerful reality. We should when we pray the Lord's Prayer, start thinking in terms of this kind of thing. God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him. And now we're asking for that to happen here now all around us to advance the kingdom, to grow and to rule and to do what we do. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. The daily bread. Okay? If you're like me, you're trying to cut carbs, so you know, you're thinking, what, should I pray for bread? You know, I don't know. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26 says, "Look, at, this is Jesus talking, look at the birds of the air. We looked at this in our first day of prayer study. Do they, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet, according to the Discovery Channel, they do all this on instinct. <laughs> oh, wait, we're on a different channel right now. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Do you see the opposite narrative there? Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Do you see how this works? Do you see how the whole prayer is based upon who you and I are, who He is, what He does, and what we're asking Him to do? I'm wanting you to have joy in your heart when you pray the Lord's Prayer. Don't pray it like something you were taught in confirmation class 20 years ago, and if you mess up, you know, oh, oh. You know, in fact, maybe, in, maybe you could take the Lord's Prayer and break it open and make it a template for all your prayers, because that's kind of what Jesus said. This is how you should pray. When we pray for our daily bread, we're praying for all the things that we need, right? And I think you can include what you want too. But just understand that the Lord has a very specific plan for this world. And it's not for us to all necessarily have everything we want. Although you'll find He will give you tremendous amounts of what you want along the way of saving those who are lost and bringing the kingdom to bear upon this world. Because you are much more valuable than all the world out there that He is already taken care of. Look at Matthew 18. Because you remember that chilling statement at the end of our reading? The chilling statement was, if you don't forgive, then your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. And you're like, well, wait a minute, Mark. Didn't you start off by saying, you know, it's not about what we do? And of course it's not about what you do. But at the same time, it's, it's about who you are. And so <laughs> Peter goes to Jesus. Peter, remember, he's one of the apostles. And he says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? When remember, in their culture, if you forgave someone six times, you got the gold star. So Peter was going to get the double gold star and say, I'll even go seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Do you think that meant that he got a bigger uh, spreadsheet out to keep track? No. This means a gazillion. This means never ending. This means keep forgiving. See, if we're going to say to Jesus, Lord, I believe in you, I trust in you, I want to follow you. And I'm so thankful that you've forgiven me my debt that I could never pay. But then someone comes alongside of us and he does something that hurts us. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but it, it will if it hasn't. He or she will hurt us. And you know what? Here's the other part we don't like to talk about. We're probably going to hurt them too, sooner or later. How many times shall we forgive them? You know, Peter's like, hey, I'll do seven times. Again and again and again and again because it's who we are. We're following Jesus. If you don't want to follow Jesus, then fine, get out. We, whatever you want to do is fine. But the Lord is saying, if you're going to follow me, this is what we do. This is how we do it because of who we are. And you, aren't, you, aren't, you don't gain righteousness because you forgive somebody 83 times. You are righteous to begin with. And because you are righteous, this is how we roll. This is how we roll. This is who we are, and this is what we do. And that's why we also pray, 
Lead us not into temptation. Take a look at James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Because, you know, it's like, well, why do we pray? This is a strange part of the prayer. Why are we asking the Lord not to lead us into temptation? Because look at James 1. For the God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So God does not tempt. So why are we asking him to not tempt? But look at this. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. And if you were to read more about James, he's going to continue in there. He's going to say that your desire will lead to sin and your sin will lead to death. And any of us here who have ever followed that pattern know it pretty well. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much how it goes. That's an accurate play-by-play call. See, we're praying when we pray, lead us not into temptation, is we're praying for the Lord to lead us, to lead us away from temptation in such a way. See, and this is where, you know, if we were going to change the Lord's prayer and make it more modern, we would say, lead us away from temptation. But, you know, if you change the Lord's prayer, people get upset, so you can't do that. But I want you guys to know what the words are. Lead us away from temptation. Keep us away from the evil one. And, and, and all of the things that go along with that, that's our prayer. And so we're praying, we're recognizing our brokenness, and we're praying about that. Now, deliver us. Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. Another passage we looked at a few weeks ago, but one that we cannot stop looking at. Because remember what we read in the, in the, in the NIV here, it said, deliver us from the evil one. So we've got to remember who's in charge. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you, does that mean somebody else or does that mean you? That means you. You have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. The powers and authorities he's talking about are not people named Trump or Clinton or you know, go to other countries and find Putin or whoever. He's talking about the accuser, the evil one, and his ilk, the demonic powers of this world. Because they're the ones behind the evil in this world. They always are. The Scripture's clear about that. And you know, in the 21st century, we may feel a little awkward talking that way, but the Scripture just keeps coming at us with this proclamation. And he's trying to say, you are not vulnerable to those things. You you do not stand alone in those things. Christ fills your heart, and because He fills your heart with His fullness, He dwells in us. We are bodily able to resist every power and authority. You've got to remember when Paul wrote these words, he would not long later be, be you know, have beheaded or maybe even sawed in half by the emperor named Nero. But you know, another fact is, here some 2,000 years later, we name our children Paul and we name our dogs Nero. So there's a very big difference in the reality of who's running the show. Do you follow me? And there was an empire that he was in charge of that no longer exists. And, and yet Christianity has become the most changing force in the, in the history of the world. So when we pray this, we're not praying for the short game. Okay? Sometimes in this world, Paul would say it many times, Peter as well, and the Apostle John in their writings, they would say, um, guess what? You're signing up for a rough gig. No promises it's all going to be great. Quite the contrary. If you follow Jesus, you're going to get persecuted. But you have been given Christ in all of his fullness, and that's over every power and authority. We're playing the long game. We're going for for the reunification of all humans, of all people to be saved and made righteous and be given hope where there isn't any hope. Our final passage, and this is an interesting one. How often do you go to church and we talk about what in the world does amen mean, right? Amen. What does amen mean? I mean, it's so important. And and it's it's just this thing that we, we must not forget. Amen means this thing that I just prayed is true. This thing that we just prayed is true. That's why we take 1 Peter chapter 4 and we lock it on to the end of the Lord's Prayer. If you notice when we pray the Lord's Prayer, Matthew stops at deliver us from the evil one, but then we grab 1 Peter chapter 4 and we drop it on the end of it and we say, for thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Because we want to praise him and remember who he is and we want to remember that amen means amen and we go back to our original prayer verse that we've been studying all month Uh, And it says, for everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. So I think with that, we should pray. Would you pray with me? Father, we ask right now that the people in this room and anyone who might hear this message, 
would be filled with your spirit. That they would know that you are living in them. That it would change the way each of us sees our neighbor, sees our family and our loved ones, the way that we see those that we don't like, the way that we see those who aggravate us and irritate us, the way that we see those that we love with great dearness and everyone in between. I pray the fact that you dwell in us would change the way we pray. That we would not pray the Lord's Prayer as something that we just sort of do like the pagans where we say lots of words or we mumble or we say it in public so that people will think we're cool. But that we say the Lord's Prayer as children crying out to their Father and all of these things that stand behind it. Lord, I pray that you would help us pray in such a way, I ask you that you would give us confidence in our prayers, that we wouldn't think, goodness gracious, I don't know how to pray, but that we would remember that Jesus has taught us precisely how to pray. And that when we don't know what to do, we'd grab a Bible and go to Matthew chapter 6 and do it all over again. And if we have to do it a hundred times, a thousand times, Lord, we pray that you give us the tenacity, the persistence to do that. I pray that you would make us seekers that we would indeed seek and that we, so that we would find. Lord, I pray that you would make us powerful and remind us that we are made righteous because of what you have done. I pray that you would make us persistent so that we don't give up. I pray that you would make us watchful so that we keep looking and seeing what you would do. And Lord, I pray that you would keep us praying the Lord's Prayer because you are our Lord and we need your help. And finally, Lord, we ask you to be with us as we go our separate ways to guide us and direct us and to live for you. We ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.